the highest priority at the moment is maybe the unemployment and how the women are treated in this whole system when it comes to unemployment and business. The question about the um, abortion law, uh, we need to immediately change uh, the one that was brought in 2013 and make it accessible to women to have a getaway from heavy situations like that. For me, a priority has always been education, not just for women in general, but especially for women, especially working on a qualitative education, but also including women from rural areas and women, even, even in Skopje, in education processes. And also one, one really important issue dealing with that myself is uh, how to keep girls safe in schools from sexual harassers. I think the priority is to work on uh, everyday lives, human rights and safety of the women who are not recognized as uh, women in a patriarchal society. The one like lesbians, sex workers, female drug users uh, and any other uh, marginalized women. I might say that yes, women are active a lot, especially when it comes to social life and many of the soft things from the society are still considered to be more like things for women, including the NGO sphere and I don't know, volunteering for different civic organizations and, and NGOs, but still we are not equal. And whenever I'm talking that we are not equal, people are just asking me, how come that you're not equal, you have all the rights in the world and still you're complaining for this and that. There was an active campaign of portraying women as, as, as mothers and having a third child and being a caregiver. Also, the, the thing is with, with the, the Grebsky government was, I think that it was in 2006 that the law on equal rights was, was adopted. Uh, or and then change and after then that. Change after, that. Uh, after uh, the new government, I don't know if I can always connect the role of the woman with the government in power, but we have seen willingness for, for, for change. I think it's not only the, the level of participation, it is very important. And I think uh, we should really push uh, for that. But uh, what we also need is having MPs or uh, uh, politically elected people who will actually uh, work on democratization of this society and gender equality as an imperative. We see that this issue is becoming less and less interesting in the political parties' agenda, but in the, also in the uh, government agenda. In this article, when I, when I was talking about Albanian women and, and their uh, engagement in politics, I was particular, particularly talking about the fact that men usually make this environment ho hostile and then accuse us for, uh, for not being able to, to join them. You cannot join an environment which has been already hosti made hostile for you. So me as a young woman, I, w I have decided for uh, like two years ago, even this, uh, this by having offers to not join a political party, particularly for this reason, because I, I, uh, I have been called names, I have been called uh, uh, not, not only na names, I, I have been judged for, for being uh, loud in a sense for, for, for a woman. So it is hard to join a, a, an environment which men already have made hostile for you. And as an Albanian woman, being part of minority, it's a small community. We practically know each other, all of us. And it is hard to be part of a political party if tomorrow somebody's gonna say, she was there, she did this, she did that. 
and having them not to represent in the political party programs is the worst decision. Uh, it, I mean, it's the worst act that a political party can make because at the end of the day, we are going and voting for these parties, but not being represented in their programs and in, in, in their policy later on. Macedonia is very conservative uh, society and women experience this kind of behavior but they also tend to mark it as embarrassing and hide it with a lot of personal strategy of self-blaming. So we choose 70 women, we address to 70, around 70 women who are actually privileged and empowered because we didn't want to expose uh, so some women into the backlash that we know that will uh, happen after we share our personal stories. At the end we have uh, hundreds and hundreds of stories shared on uh, social networks and a lot of women talked on this, uh, uh, their personal stories and many of them happened 10, 5, 20 years ago and this is why the, the campaign name is I Speak Up Now. It's because in that time we were not in position to speak because all of the sexual harassment, 80 or 90 percent of the shared stories are experiences of sexual harassment by the position of power. Mm -hmm. And majority of them, more than half, more than 50 percent, were happening inside the educational institutions, so elementary, secondary school and universities. I was surprised uh, how many uh, negative comments were there from the general public, especially from men and women also, let's not forget that angle as well, as uh, judging those women that they're speaking now after, I don't know, maybe 20 years and there were, they were, they, there were some situations that they talked about that, that they were scary. And also we should, we should talk about those uh, microaggressions that are happening because this is where the thing starts and then escalates to, to a bigger level. So we have two types of responses, most of them. One is uh, minimizing the experience of sexual harassment, saying that it's not, and focusing on among hundreds and hundreds of stories. I've done research after that, few students done, and I was mentoring the process. Only two cannot be defined as sexual, as sexual harassment, and all the attention was on these two. And the second was to, why is it anonymous? Why we do not name our uh, perpetrators or uh, our aggressors. And the reason why not, uh, it, it, there are many reasons, many reasons why, but I think uh, the tendency to ask for names is to pri privatize the, uh, the guilt. And this is not something Macedonia or our society doesn't have five or 10 or 50 uh, aggressors that we can focus and it, it's something that is inside the culture. And we have to start from the root, you know. Now we have situation, as Elena was mentioning, that we are a super traditional society, yes, but then we also have problems within the families because women, children and girls are treated differently and then are taught uh, different values and patterns of behavior. And then we have crucial problems within the educational system, not only when it comes to sexual harassment and violence, but generally speaking, when we talk about girls and women, then we have this balance of power even since the age, I don't know, of two, whatever, you know, when they start going to the kindergarten, and then they proceed in the other uh, instances of the educational system. Before we, we even started to organize the festival, it was six years ago, um, we were uh, thinking that we should do something in this country, something like this, a feminist festival, and because all the other countries on the Balkan have, and we needed to follow this, uh, this fashion. The political timing was right. Um, as you spoke previously, it was a right-wing government, and uh, they started uh, um, pushing hard with uh, Firstly, the uh, law on uh, restrictive abortion, uh, which made harder for, for women to, in such situation to, to make it easier uh, for them. Uh, and other, other things beginning to happen in our society and we thought that it is the right time to do this um, feminist festival in Skopje. 
So what we did is actually gather all activists and, uh, and other uh, civil society organizations. They helped a lot through the years of the festival. And we started a program where they will present their work and um, many women, uh, many people from uh, various backgrounds, for example, from the academy, but also women, uh, successful women in other professional fields and business. We worked with Association of Housewives. Uh, we worked with um, a lot of uh, other marginalized groups of women. And we wanted to create a non-exclusive space where together we would fight, uh, let's say, for a common enemy, the patriarchy or whatever we want to call it. I think that uh, Firstborn Girl Festival, it's one of the rare spaces where you can actually discuss women and feminist uh, issues. It's not, it's not a topic that is uh, intervened inside the mainstream media or uh, yeah. the dominant public discourse. So we have to claim spaces where we can meet and discuss and mm -hmm. it's very inclusive and it's... Uh, mm -hmm. There were sex workers also there sharing yeah. their struggles single mothers. Yeah, sex workers, um, activists and politicians on the same table have the discussion and, you know, talk about the problems that we face every day. And w when we started, we had questions from, I don't know, fellow guys like, are we allowed to go to your festival or um, have uh, comments like, um, I want to struggle for women's rights, but I'm not a feminist. We try to, you know, <laughs> bring the term feminist uh, at light and talk about what it means because we've been there and now I think we are on some other level where other things are being discussed. I feel that, that, that this festival is really needed. I remember a few months ago, they're one of the most watched TV shows, political TV shows. Uh, the TV host said, one of the, the guests said feminism and the TV host stopped her and said, I'm sorry, can we not use that word because it might scare our, our audience. So <laughs> bringing the, the term feminism through, through the for, for Firstborn Festival and in, in mainstream media as a normal thing, it's really, really necessary in so Macedonia. Throughout these years, we really needed to talk about sexual education. And yeah. this is what we focused on as well. Uh, because, uh, I don't know, we, we, in the um, school curriculum there is nothing like this and, and we really need to work upon this, uh, get into schools and uh, educate young people about, you know, sexual education because this lacks a lot. And maybe if we brought this issue not only talking on for feministic things and uh, rights, uh, women rights, whatever, on the festival, but also within the curricula as having the comprehensive sexu sexual education in the, um, I don't know, primary and secondary schools, then I think that we can create even more alliance and even more partners within, you know, the structures that we already have. Yeah, it's about bringing the change regionally and institutionally as well. Of course, yeah.